Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Christian Formation, our adult group. Um, we've got a video going for those at home. I'm going to turn this around. Oh, that's not but yes, we do have a full group. <laughs> Discussion of evil and the devil. <laughs> because that's what we're doing. It's been a good conversation so far. And uh, so I've been using this book called The Devil, or excuse me, the book is called uh, Satan and the Problem of Evil from the Bible to the Early Church Fathers. And then uh, this course, we I just gave it a name The Devil and the Details How Satan Fits in Scripture and Why Evil Persists. So today we're focusing on our first one Satan and Scripture. Um, so the first week I kind of went through and just named a whole bunch of passages in the Bible where that word shows up in Hebrew or Greek. And so uh, today, this chapter in the book, I'm not going to get into it a lot because a lot of it is basically a really long paper, like I had to write in seminary. <laughs> in uh, class, we had two different Hebrew classes. One was Hebrew language. Or we worked on the language and learning how it works and translating things. The other was called Hebrew content, where you had to interpret things and write papers. Um, I had to write a twenty-page final paper on the passage from Judges. So things like that. That's how this reads. We're not going to do that. Okay. Um, there's some interesting information in here. I'll, I'll touch on some of it, but I'm not going to let this lead the discussion today. I'm just going to borrow from a couple of things here. Uh, but what it does get into is uh, this chapter is called Satan and the Devil in the Hebrew Bible and Septuagint. And you might, well, let me do that for a second. Um, you might remember uh, Hebrew Bible is what the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Septuagint was the first translation of the Old Testament that was written down, but it was in Greek. The Septuagint means 70. There were 70 scholars, the story goes, that worked on this translation to put the Old Testament in Greek. Eventually, probably a couple centuries later, it eventually ended up back in Hebrew, which was the original language. Um, but when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, it's usually going through the Greek Septuagint. So that's why I've said this a couple times, but in case you missed it, um, that's why if uh, you're reading something like today, we'll cut this. In the Gospel lesson, you'll have... Uh, the gospel writer or Jesus quoting the Old Testament, in this case Isaiah. Well, we have that same Isaiah reading as our Old Testament reading. And you might notice some little differences. Sometimes the differences are bigger. My favorite one is at Palm Sunday when it says that Jesus you know, sent his disciples into the city to get the, the colt, right? The donkey of the colt. Or the, the colt of the donkey. And, and then it says he rode in on a donkey and on a colt. It's like, wait, what? He's riding to the animal? It's like, what? Well, I'm seeing. Like, so what happened? Well, what, what it was is, in the original Hebrew, whenever they did that kind of, wherever you see lots of indentations, like the Psalms or a lot of the prophecies, it's because the language was a poetic language. And the way Hebrew poetry works is a lot of repetition. So they would say something, and then they would say the same thing in slightly different ways. So it's say like, let's. They don't do this in Psalm twenty three, but let's say they'd be, uh, you know, the Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. Uh, the God, God Most High, guides me, and I will not lack for anything. Okay, it's almost the same thing, mm -hmm. but it's slightly different. So when it went from Hebrew to Greek, and then got quoted, they're like, well, I guess he wrote two donkeys. Okay, <laughs> so that stuff like that comes through, and it's okay. You can still get back to the original. The idea is, is that Jesus was fulfilling the long expectations and the hopes for what the Messiah would be. That's the point. Okay, If you get caught up in the details, you'll get in trouble. Um, 
I will get frustrated. I, I get the point, but I will forever picture Jesus coming in on on uh, two animals. What do you ever see? Right. <laughs> it's it's in the brain, and I love it. That, no. <laughs> He's going to be lots of lots of <laughs> 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 Midwest, Mother Donkey always has the so that's that's the idea okay um that's what that set to is so what we're going to do is we're going to pick up on a few things on how the word satan and when the word satan was used in the old testament it's not a lot you might remember from that first week i pulled out one two three um job everybody kind of knew about that one uh zechariah a lesser known passage we'll read that one today and then another one from first chronicles there are a few other places where that word is in in hebrew satan or hasatan if it's the satan um and we'll, we'll touch on a couple of those but those are not used in the same way as as what later christianity would say is oh it's the devil it's satan with a capital s so we'll, we'll hit a couple of the well, more well-known passages. Um, I want to read just a little bit from the introduction of this book because I think it's helpful. Um, Rivka Sharp Kluger, that's his. Okay, so right away we're getting into some other biblical scholar. <laughs> that's why we're not reading a lot of this yet. Um, In the world of the Old Testament, names are not sound and fume, but they have magic power. They are substantial and therefore, in effect, identical with the nature of their bearers. And that is very true. Anytime you get a name in the Old Testament, it's probably good to find a study Bible or a Bible dictionary or jump online, and if you have a reputable page to go to, um, or even a baby name book, and say, well, what, what does this name mean? And if they give a name, it's important. They do it for a reason. So in the story of, in the book of Ruth, uh, the two daughters-in-law, uh, Ruth and I can't remember her name, Orpa, I think, was where Oprah's name came from. They wrote her name down wrong on the birth certificate. <laughs> it was supposed to be biblical. Um, their names mean something like bitterness and wailing. I can't remember exactly right now, but they're, they're much as <laughs> right? So that, I mean, and if you think of um, when somebody gets renamed, especially, so Jacob, okay, mm -hmm. gets renamed to Israel. That means one who wrestles, one who strives with God. From that wrestling match before he reconciles with Esau. So names are usually important. And so that's that's where we're getting to. Um, this looks to be the case with the Hebrew terms Satan or Hasatan. Peggy Day examines the etymology, so like the, the roots of the words, and the meaning and the use of the noun Satan in the Hebrew Bible and the Septuagint, focusing on Numbers 22, Job 1 and 2, Zechariah 3, there is that there is not one celestial Satan in the Hebrew Bible, but rather the potential for many. We talked about this. It's the accuser in the heavenly court, or it's the tempter, or maybe just a, a general adversary. Um, I thought there was two more, or one more. Well, maybe mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Others, scholars and lay people alike, have argued that its use in the Hebrew Bible is out of a proper name. Which connects it to the later Christian Satan. Uh, it was like this semi autonomous. There's two chances. I think it's like a little. I can't switch. 
We're adding more minutes as we go. That's good. We'll add more for them at home, too. Yeah, you don't have to people that's less. Unless you have folks saying, like, what's this great Bible study thing? We're going to do it. We're going to do it. We might have to have to make another word. We'll be happy. We have the ability to do that. Well, we basically have the congregation. I think we're ready for the other one. I'm trying to work entire. The food's really good over there. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to take those out. But if anybody's traveling, if they miss a week, if they are sick, and you know, if people are sick, I know we've got one council member with Scott right now. So, yeah. So if you're sitting in the you can start on to miss anything. Especially in one like this where we kind of built this for those. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with it. We just have to work out the catch up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Okay. We're getting better at cameras and microphones ordered. So anyway, um, so the name Satan is important, and that's what we're gonna dig into is what what does this mean? Okay, what does this thing mean and then where does it show up in the Hebrew Bible? So real quick, skim through a couple of these lines. Um, okay. Uh, it is suggested that the term originates from the Hebrew root, and the Hebrew letters are sin, tate, and to persecute, oppose, or to be hostile toward, or more specifically, to accuse. Um, Satan, or a form of it, appears 28 times in the Hebrew Bible. Does that number strike you as low? Yeah. That surprised me how low it was. And especially if you think that one passage will have it show up several times. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so uh, it first is used in Genesis 26 on the story of Isaac reclaiming the wells of his father Abraham in the valley of Gerar, ruled by Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Okay. Um, and it, it basically comes down to um, um, where is it? Isaac calls the well Sitna because he had to um, accuse the Philistines of filling in the wells and basically be in opposition to them. So one well got named um, to contend with, and the other name got named, the other well got named a God to oppose. Okay, so again, if you see a name, a proper noun in the Old Testament, it usually means something like that. Sometimes you have to look at the little footnotes. Sometimes you have to look at them. Um, Bethlehem means house of bread. Think about that. Um, Bethel, Bethel means the house of God. Um, so all these names give more meaning to what you read. Um, the root is used in a similar way to act as an adversary in 1 Samuel 29, which identifies David as the adversary of the Philistines. Okay, so it's not like David is Satan. He's he's just an opponent. Mm -hmm. He's he's in, in opposition to. Well, like you said the other day, when when Christ told uh, you know, like Peter. Peter to get behind you, Satan, he wasn't saying he was. He was just an adversary. Found my face, yeah. he didn't change the mind. Though. Now, by that point, there may have been an extra connotation to it, because um, mm -hmm. they knew more of the stories of the Old Testament and some of those other things that were written in between. You know, the extra stuff. Um, but yeah, he wasn't saying, Peter, you're the devil. Just, you're acting in that way. Um, 2 Samuel 19, David calls the sons of Saruiah, his adversaries, for what you will be to me this day and hour. Um, the term should be considered a function rather than the office of the court. Um, Solomon, at one point when all the military campaigns are over, it says that Solomon has no Satans anymore, no military foes, no opposition anymore. Hmm. Um, there's another guy, uh, Hadad the Edomite was raised up as a Satan, a Satan against Solomon. Okay. Um, in the Septuagint, the Greek version, it's a word that comes from Diabolos, which is devil. It's 
and diabolon, to falsely accuse, so like to endevil somebody, right? Um, so uh, accusers in the Psalms, um, the psalmist says, you know, God is being attacked by slanderous enemies. Um, I'm being attacked, God, by slanderous enemies, the ones who accuse me. So if you ever see that in the Psalms, there are those who accuse me, there are my opponents, they're surrounded by adversaries. Sometimes it comes back to this, right? It makes more sense when they talk about the great Satan in Revelation versus the Emperor. Yeah. Yeah, because if Revelation is about this horrible persecution being perpetrated by one of the Roman empires against Christians, then yeah, very much in opposition, an opponent, an adversary. <laughs> uh, an adversary you can't beat on your own. So that's why the vision of Revelation gives them hope. Because even if they get killed in the middle of this, God in the end, in the long term, will bring them to the place where where heaven comes down to earth, where there's no more tears or pain or war, right? If you if you don't if you approach Revelation like it's you know something you need to decoder ring from Cracker Jacks to figure out like connect the dots like Nostradamus and who who which leader is wait is that Putin is that Hitler like you know if instead you say this was a message of cosmic hope that was so outlandish <laughs> because it they needed something outlandish because the persecution was that bad to me that would have helped Luther <laughs> because he was like Revelation is dumb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, this is so complicated that, yes. that the person reading the Bible it wouldn't make any sense to them. It's like it's a gospel of straw. Get rid of it. So, um, gospel of straw. Yeah. I like that. Did you use the. No, it's just. Oh, it's over. Okay. I just didn't want to cover it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then they go into the saying, well, there's another word, septum, with an M that's probably related. It means to bear a grudge. Yeah, we're not going to that. Um, other Hebrew root words, there's something from Zechariah 4. Um, this was interesting. I will do this. So we find in Zechariah 4.10, the interpretation of part of Zechariah's vision, which reads, "There are these seven are the eyes of the Lord. They are going to and fro upon all the earth. Uh, another biblical scholar argues, these seven eyes are like the individuals described in the 5th century B.C. Greek historian Herodotus's histories as the eyes and the ears of the king, individuals recognized as inspectors or overseers in that empire. So the biblical scholar suggests that in Zechariah, when it uses that word Satan and these eyes and ears, it just means they're God's eyes and ears upon the earth. It's a term people would have recognized from when it was written down. Um, and that the Satan did not find fault with this individual. Uh, he provoked them. Right. And then this covers some stuff we didn't talk about. Uh, enough of this for a little while. Okay, we just highlighted for quite a while. Okay. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts? A little bit of background. Um, I've talked about the creation story before, maybe not so much in this class, but I've talked about how the who is more important than the how, right? Because a lot of folks try to do the whole evolution versus creation thing, and I feel like that's just missing the whole point. We can learn from both. I think God is active in both. And I've said many times in the confirmation class and other places that the Bible was not intended to be a science textbook. That's not what the what the Holy Spirit was trying to do with it. So when I look at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, as, a, as I'm somebody who's had some science in my life and had some classes, if I approach that scientifically, I'm going to get frustrated. Because Genesis 1 is about each day order being brought, and there's some more creation. And, and humans are created in the image of God, and we are put on earth to be and dominion in the sense of, of as a caretaker, right? Genesis 2, the order of creation is different. God gets in there in the clay and makes Adam, which means like dirt man, uh, <laughs> right into names. Uh, Eve's created out of the rib. Adam names the animals. God brings life into them. Completely different in Genesis 1. But each of those tells us something important 
about uh, who God is, who we are, what our relationship with God is, how God intended things to be. So it's truth, maybe not in a science textbook sort of way, but it's truth about who we are, how God wanted us to be, how much God loves us, what our responsibilities are in the creation, um, things like that. So I say that because in those particular two chapters, uh, if I would lead a class on those, I would be talking about what does this teach us about God? What does this teach us about ourselves? So as we go through these four passages, I'm not expecting or wanting biblical scholar stuff. Well, I remember reading in, in Schmitz Holtz that they said that this means this. Okay, no, we don't need to do that. Um, what I want to do with each of these passages is explore what does this teach us about God? What does this teach us about ourselves? If that can help us figure out this whole Satan and evil stuff, great. Uh, we'll, we'll see what it does. Um, let's start with numbers. Do we have a stack of Bibles around the corner still, or did they get moved? Uh, I think there, there's a couple behind the TV, it looks like there. All right. <laughs> numbers, you said? Yes. Do have a volunteer that can read numbers? Chapter 22. 22 to 35. You might write between these. I know they keep coming. Man, I saw it sound like two. <laughs> it's like really what chapter, what chapter is number? Chapter is number. Chapter is number. Chapter is number. Starting at verse 22. <laughs> 22. Mm -hmm. Okay, to when? But God was angry that Balaam was going, so he sent the angel of the Lord to stand in the road to block his way. As Balaam and two servants were riding along, Balaam's donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. The donkey bolted off the road into the field, but Balaam beat it and turned it back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood at the place where the road narrowed between two vineyard walls, when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it tried to squeeze by and it crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So Balaam beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved farther down the road and stood in a place too narrow for the donkey to get by at all. This time, when the donkey saw the angel, it lay down under Balaam. In a fit of rage, Balaam beat the animal again with a staff. Then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. What have I done to you that deserves your beating me? Three times, it asked Balaam. You have made me look like a fool, Balaam shouted. If I had a sword with me, I would kill you. But I am the same donkey you have ridden all your life, the donkey answered. Have I ever done anything like this before? No, Bob admitted. <laughs> then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the roadway with a drawn sword in his hand. Balaam bowed his head and, and fell, his, fell face down on the ground before him. Why did you beat your donkey those three times, the angel of the Lord demanded? Look, I have come to block your way because you are stubbornly resisting me. 35. 35. Three times the donkey saw me and shied away. Otherwise, I would certainly have killed you by now and spared the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> and Mom confessed to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I didn't realize you were standing in the road to block my way. I will return home if you are against my going. But the angel of the Lord told Balaam, go with these men, but say only what I tell you to say. So Balaam went on with Balak's officials. Thank you. So first, if you ever need a passage in the Bible to say uh, why you should be against cruelty to animals, here you go. Uh, second, you might not have known this, but Shrek was based on the Bible. No. Okay, enough of the jokes. What do you hear in this one? First of all, verse 22. God's anger was kindled. I don't, what was in your translation? God's anger was kindled because he was going, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the road as his adversary. What was it in your translation? But God was angry that Balaam was going, so he sent the angel of the Lord to stand in the road to block his way. To block his way? Oh, you lose it. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the Satan right there. Mm -hmm. Is the adversary. And it might come out a little bit later when he's like, you know, uh, when, when he says, I didn't know that you were standing in the road to oppose me. I didn't double check that. But that's that's where the word Satan refers in this passage. That the way, angel yeah. is there as a satan as an adversary. The Hebrew um, translation has a satan. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's 
a handy little. <laughs> okay, so what does this teach you about God, about us? Balaam, this Balaam is supposed to be going to talk to this Balak guy who was against God. Even though God wanted Balaam to go, he wants to make sure he's on the right path. So what, what does this teach us about ourselves, about God? Immediately what popped in my mind is uh, is getting stuck in traffic. <laughs> it, really, it really did. Um, and partly because I have really tried over the past few years to calm myself when I'm faced with something like that and realize, you know, maybe it's not just about me. Maybe there's a reason that I'm stuck behind this person going 35 in a 45 mile an hour zone. You know, little things like that. Um, but that's what popped in my head. Is Speaking of that, that's happened a few times where I got stuck behind something. Ah! You get the road, there's a cop sitting there. So yeah. if I would, I'd get a So yeah, sometimes it makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so that, that sense of if I'm being blocked, opposed, maybe there's a reason, maybe there's a reason, reason for it. Yeah. Or even if it wasn't that the cop was going to give you a ticket, maybe it is just that sort of like, okay, slow down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a reason I need to slow down and yeah. quiet. <laughs> sometimes, I don't know if this is related or not, but sometimes I'll just have a random song pop in my head. Like, completely unrelated to anything. And I have learned that if I stop and think of what the lyrics are, or if it's just the refrain, if I stop and look it up, that my subconscious is trying to tell me something. Oftentimes it's making a joke at my own expense. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, there's, there's sometimes, maybe something's trying to get attention. Anybody else? What do you hear from this passage about God? About people? Well, that we can be satanic and God at the same, at the same time. Oh my gosh, you skipped to my last point. <laughs> <laughs> You're reading the book. Have you seen his <laughs> But yeah, yeah, we can be doing God's will and then getting out of one way at the same time. All the time. All the time. Don't always, you know, I read it as, don't always think you know what the best course is. Um, as far as if you, he doesn't know, he doesn't understand why his donkey's doing what he's doing, but he, he thinks he knows everything is what I could take out of it and not, we don't always know the full story. If you're angry about something at work, don't come home and kick the dog. Kick the dog, not the husband. Stop to see what is actually going on here. Don't just find out what you're talking. One one thing that struck me was that the donkey saw the whole thing, the slowly animal that. That Balaam was like just the donkey. I know better than him, but the the meek, the what the attitudes. Yeah, just the, 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 the yeah, just just recognizing that I don't know it all, maybe, and and I should listen to when a child says something or when. Um, and I think that all goes back with the you know. The angel of the Lord said he would he would kill the donkey, or he would kill him, kill him instead of killing the donkey. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you know he's not as important as what he thinks he yeah. is, yeah. which kind of goes back with the the me. You know he thinks he's he's important, but he really isn't. Mm -hmm. That is a theme through a lot of these that we can see is that somebody gets too big for their britches, mm -hmm. thinks they're up here, and is the function of the Satan's mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. It is God saying, "Oh, you have to take it down." Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, bless your heart. You don't. <laughs> All that. Mm -hmm. okay. Here we go, Southern <laughs> I've always had a little. <laughs> Rams from Alabama. Um, okay, so let's let's keep those thoughts. Not all of these lessons don't all go together, but I'm sure, as with other things in the Bible, we'll pick up on some things. Thank you for that one. Um, next example. Um, Job. 
It's a tough book. I was writing for the Psalms. Psalms are the biggest and easiest book to find in the Bible. I showed this trick to trip the confirmation students. Can I borrow this one, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so if you ever need to get to the New Testament, take the Bible, go about halfway. Usually you'll end up in either Psalms, Isaiah, this one case, Jeremiah, one of those prophets. Take the second half, do it again. Luke. Okay, it gets you right somewhere in the first couple Gospels, but if you ever need a shortcut, that's me. Good one. Um, all right, Job, we're going to skip around a little because we're not reading two whole chapters. So let's do Job chapter 1, 6 to 12, and chapter 2, 1 through 8. Who wants to jump on that one? That's 6 through 12. Yeah. One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord and the accuser Satan came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, Yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection <clears throat> around him in his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take everything he has, and he surely will curse your, to your face. All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. And then chapter 2, verse 3. Oh, and in between, Job loses everything mm -hmm. and does not curse him. Mm -hmm. So then we come back to chapter 2, 1 through 8. One day the members of the heavenly court came again to present themselves before the Lord and the accuser Satan came with him. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the fine. Am I reading the same thing again? No, no, that's oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, have you noticed my, certain, my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil, and he has maintained his integrity, even though you urged him to urged me to harm him without cause. Satan replied to the Lord, skin for skin, a man will give up everything he has to save his life, but reach out and take away his health and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, do with him as you please, the Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. So Satan left the Lord's present and he struck Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sat among the ashes. First of all, we have Satan going to and fro along around the earth. That kind of feels like that what the seven eyes played with him before, mm -hmm. patrolling, checking on things, mm -hmm. going back. Clearly, in this, I think I said the first week, Job is is a big parable. That was how um, Israelites saw this. If you go to the Hebrew Bible, it's not stuck in the middle like this. It's kind of at the end, um, as as sort of the uh, Psalms and Job, these these more poetic, um, more all that type of things, maybe not like the histories. Um, but clearly, God is in charge and is giving the Satan and like well, like it's like the court title, giving him permission and ability to do these things. So as you read these two passages. What does it teach us about God, about ourselves? <laughs> Keeping in mind that this is in biblical writing, more like a long version of Jesus' parables than it is you know, like the, the kings, the chronicles of the We have the choice to choose God or not. Luther would argue with that a little bit, but sure. Well, he yeah. can. He can cast blame to God or not. Sure, I should say. Sure. When he, he he does not curse God when he loses everything. Still, it's interesting. A lot of charities have this um, attitude towards their clients. Well, you know, your issues are a result of your choices, but we'll help you. But there's this, sort of this we're here and you're there. But in this one, it says like, well, this thing's happened to him without cause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So that I mean that has a both perfect and good things happen, bad things happen. Mm -hmm. Keep going. They do. I, yes, we do have consequences for our own actions. Do we ever? And at the same time, sometimes things happen to you that are out of your control. Well, I I don't understand. <clears throat> it's like God. He set him up. He set Job up. He said, "Go pick on Job." You know, that was like nice. that's what <laughs> yeah. You know, why did he do that? I mean, I guess he knew that Job could handle it, but you know, and he never gives a reason, right? <laughs> you know, why didn't he say go pick on Harry or Abraham or you know? <laughs> it's a struggle. It really is, and people have wrestled with it since the past. Well, if you look on further, even Job's wife told him to. <laughs> Give up. <laughs> his wife, his friends, like, just first God, get it over. Right. Or admit Except that you did something did wrong. wrong. Yes. Right. Except that you did yeah. wrong. Yep. And Job refuses to admit that he did wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's like the first time, the, the number three. Well, his wife says, first God did that. No, yeah. Right. Greek gods did to uh, mortals. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's on the same token where they used to play with them like pawns. Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons it's troubling is as you read the rest of Scripture, God is personal in relationship. Yes, you screwed up. You worshiped idols. You didn't take care of the poor. There will be consequences, but I will be with you. I will bring you back from exile, right? Mm -hmm. That's the bigger story. And this one does. It does feel mm -hmm. more like something you read in Greek mythology yeah. or mm -hmm. one of the other things where the, you know, the, the word capricious, right? Where, you know, like, like you've got dance puppets, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. That's for me why it's important to think what type of literature this is in the Bible. It is, it is a, a story that teaches something. And I, I don't feel like it's. I, I've mentioned this before. There's a Far Side cartoon, and it said um, at God's computer or something like that, and it has a computer screen, and on the screen is a guy walking under a piano on the road, and at the keyboard, God's got his finger over a button that says smite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, but I don't feel like this. <laughs> and part of that is, I think, when I was speaking in the past when her Katrina came through, and I London, when I see some of the televangelists, you know, I'd be like, well, that's because of the sinful nature of New Orleans, or that's 9-11 was attributed to Pagans and feminists, right? Mm -hmm. I, a couple of guys. And, um, and so I'm mean, like, I, I just don't see God wiping out everybody else to get at those. I feel like God would be able to be more precise. So I, the more in scripture I am, the more I react. You know, but. Well, it's like when somebody says, well, it's my time, it's my time, so I don't worry about it. And you said, well, what? If you're an airplane and happens to be their pilot's time, what's your problem? Then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those kind of catch all phrases yeah, like a little hard to handle. When you're in the middle of grief over a loved one who has died, somebody saying to you, well meaning everything happens for a reason, might not be the most yeah, helpful true. thing to you. It might make them feel better, or it might be an attempt to make you feel better. But then you start going, Well, what was the reason? Mm -hmm. Could God have gotten that reason accomplished? Then? Right. So you, it leads you down a different track. But then again, is God completely absent? Like it opens this whole can of worms. <laughs> so uh, what about the ones where somebody goes right to the left, or if they gone left and right. kind of wiped out, and all these two people with the tornado, they decide to go right. this way, and, right. and the room they were going to go in is totally gone. And mm -hmm. right. Right. And it's, yeah. you know, so were you chosen, or? Yeah. Walk down the hallway at the hospital. Every room's got somebody praying for that person to get better. Mm -hmm. Some will do, some will not. So yeah, if you start going down the road of, uh, well, you must have done something wrong, that's why Luther ends up at, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to heaven and all of that, and no, we have no free will, we have no choice. It's got to be grace. It's got to be God. Because otherwise, we will always fall short. He said, if you go by the letter of the law and the rules, we're always going to screw up. But if it's God's grace, then we respond to so that that's why Luther's really hard on that, you know. You know, when when a Lutheran hears somebody say, you know, uh, 
uh, I, on this day, I gave my I gave my heart to Jesus. I was saved. Lutherans instinctively like. No. <laughs> <laughs> or every time you gotta get saved, you gotta get rebaptized. You know, but just you know, change your opinion, and you have really nothing to do with it. So now, I think there is something to say about that impulse of wanting to get baptized, and I think there's something important about being able to mark that day of conversion of of that light bulb coming on, or that I'm accepting God in a new way today. I think that Luther's missed out on that. Mm -hmm. That sort of pivotal, monumental experience that you can, you know, commemorate a day of. I, I hate to say it, but I take, I take a little um, exception to that. Sure. And the reason why is mm -hmm. when I was first Christianized as a, a 35 years of age, I didn't have the Cecil B. the Mill. Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. So I had one guy tell me that, that I was not a Christian because I didn't have it. Right. And I, I argued with that guy. I still do. I will argue with anybody that says that because you can have a conversion without changing oh, yeah. anything. And I don't think you need it, but I don't think it's... I think what I'm trying to say is that Lutherans get all their hackles up because somebody's like, well, I chose Jesus. Well, I don't know if that's true. But it's not to say that that, that is not important at all. That's what I was trying to say. Sometimes, like, I, sometimes, I, sometimes I think it's, it's personality. Oh, sure. So I say my call story, like... Getting into the ministry, figuring out what God wanted to do with me, was more of a different switch than a light switch. Yeah, yeah. It is gradual. gradual. Yeah, yeah totally. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I got a soft track that time. Sorry. Uh, anything else on Job? I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Since we're talking about adversary. Yeah. Who are the adverts? Who's who is Satan the adversary to in Job's story? To God. Job or to God? Good point. Good point. Because it's God Good that choice. raises it, right? Like. Like everything's going fine, and God's like, "Hey, what about Job?" And yeah. God gives right. permission. Job was a pawn. God like gives permission. God. It's almost like God yeah. saying, "Isn't Job great?" And saying, "Like, well, he was a pawn." So it could be God and Satan. It could be, and that's why one of the definitions comes through as that the accuser or the adversary was a function in a royal court. To just make sure that things were what they were supposed to be. So is it in this case like the angel on the road just that they inhibiting? Or is it just somebody whose whole being is supposed to be contrary? So God says, Isn't Job great? Then in this case, his whole job is to be like, prove it. You know. I know people like that. Prosecuting attorney being the Satan and sure. And so they're actually it's not the individual so much, it's the process. Exactly. That's what a lot of biblical scholars have said about it. So what does that teach us about God? It teaches us that God is paying attention to us. That whether it's Satan or those seven eyes or whatever, that God is going to and fro on the earth. It started in the garden, right? God was walking in the garden, Adam and Eve were hiding. That didn't stop once they left the garden. So there's still, I suppose you could call it monitoring, but God is still involved in keeping an eye on things. What else does it, it, it says that God knows us individually. Look at Job over here. Um, it tells us that we are, when faced with the worst situations, that most folks would assume we would either blame God or that, that our instinct is to look for a cause. And the frustrating thing about the book of Job is at the end, you don't get an answer. <laughs> God just says, you can't understand me. I am beyond you. The end. We, don't, <laughs> we don't get any because there. So that's that's the bigger section. The bigger section. How are we doing? Um, I guess we got to do that again. Um, we have a, I have a feeling we'll come back to Job because it's just mm -hmm. not good. Um, Zechariah is the next one. It's right towards the end of the Old Testament. Uh, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi are the last two. <laughs> We're at Zechariah 3, 1 to 7. Okay. 
Then he showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke, rebuke you. Is not this man a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. And to him he said, See, I have taken your guilt away from you, and I will clothe you in festal apparel. And I, and I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him in the apparel. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Then the angel of the Lord assured Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Thank you. I was not as familiar with this passage. It's not one that comes up very much. What's striking you from this one? Well, mine causes it. Yeah. My translation says the accuser, Satan, was at the angel's right hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just in case that, you know, this one. A statement, a little footnote that says, um, or the accuser, or either the adversary. So instead mm -hmm. of doing a footnote, they just go. What I find interesting, I didn't think of before, is both on equal terms. They're equal terms as far as their position. One's an accuser and one's the savior. I would say that in almost equal, because the first one, Job, has to basically get permission. Uh, sorry, Satan has to get yeah. permission to go out. So I'm talking about the angel. He was equal to the angel in this Who? In this age. The, the accuser. Of the right hand of that angel. So they were they were oh. both equal in status. One was the accuser and one was yes. the savior. So what saying, yeah. he still had it. I guess what I'm saying is early on it was that he fell out of heaven, but he still keeps his status. Oh, yeah, that one too. Yeah. 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 So he keeps his status as yeah. far as where the level he was at. Yeah, and then is this before or after the fall? Yes. Yeah. Um, but here we get the Lord rebuking the mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So what what do you make of that and the whole clothes change? Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's different than sort of Job where he goes, yeah, sure, go, go ahead. Yeah, Job's sitting in the ashes, scraping mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You going to say something? Oh. Well, and I, I looked at the I, this handy little translation, but you go to the Hebrew real quick. It says Ha Satan again. Yes. Same translation as Job. Yeah, almost all the instances in scripture are with the article. Uh, okay. So it's really interesting to me that it's, you know, is this part of the heavenly court again? And this time, no, you don't get to make this accusation. Or you don't get to play your game, accuser. I'm rejecting you this time outright because it does not fit my plan. And God says, I'm taking your guilt away, mm -hmm. new clothes. Walk my paths. This is a high priest. Remember, walk my paths. You will have access. He keeps coming back to court. You know, when the judge is God, and you got the prosecutor, and you got the defense, and you got the defending counsel. So let's let's pan out then. If you fast forward to today or to later Christianity, when you think of Satan, like when we all started this, before we started digging in, when you think of Satan, did you think of red horns, tail? No, maybe the cartoony one. Did you think of hell? Mm -hmm. Punishing people? Yeah. I just I thought of evil, evil and bad. Yeah. Yeah. Evil. Yeah. 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 I think of more of it being, you know, almost like a yin and yang, you know, where you have God who's good, and then you have Satan who's evil, mm -hmm. and then they're kind of basically battling against each other. Sure. Yeah, I always had the opinion that you, you had to know bad before you understood good, but I'm changing my attitude a little bit on that. So sure. that's what I used to think. <laughs> yeah. that you, before you know something is good, you got to feel bad first. So otherwise, you wouldn't have a point of reference, is what I thought. I'm changing that of some way now. Yeah. I can see where both can be at the same time. Mm -hmm. And and out of that, hopefully, something good comes out of it because of it. You know. God's always working. Whatever evil there is, God's always working to turn it back towards good. Uh, and then, but what I'm trying to get to is, so if there is this battle going on, whether you thought hell or <clears throat> God's adversary, that doesn't 
what's going on in these passages where Satan shows up. Mm -hmm. Satan's part of the court. Satan's part of the process. Mm -hmm. It's this accusing, testing kind of system, but God's still in charge. So it, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see how it gets from this to where we are today and what that teaches us, if anything. We might get through seven weeks or six weeks of this and go, and we still don't know. Mm -hmm. That's entirely possible. Probably. Highly likely. Well, probably. <laughs> we're, we're not any special or more special or different than anybody else who's tried to do this. We might get to the end and get the same answer Job did. Like, well. <laughs> um, but I hope we learn something about ourselves and about God as we go along. We might not get the answer of why evil, but we might get a better understanding of ourselves and God and that relationship. So in this one, God intervenes. But God intervened in Job too, just in this time it's a little quicker. And yeah, God intervened right. with uh, Balaam too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what bothers me a little bit. And every time I watch, listen to something like this or read it, there was always an outcome. And this is the outcome you're supposed to look for. But like we're saying here, I don't understand either one of these, the outcomes of why they did that they did mm -hmm. in their case. And we're still picking one passage out of the bigger section. I know, but I mean, in those positions, usually those, I don't call it parable or whatever, or an actual mm -hmm. audience, but probably parable, they usually have an answer and try to tell you, teach you something, but these really don't. Well, this one, I would say, if anything, is if you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you shall rule my house, which I think would be the temple, since he's a high priest, have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. And anything in the prophets, you got to think exile. They're about to be carted off. They're in exile, or they're coming back. Mm -hmm. And so, if you want to repair things mm -hmm. with God, and run the house of the Lord, and bring the sacrifices and all of that, walk in my ways. But that's not the same thing as these prosper prosperity preachers. Oh gosh. Well, and here's the difference. This might be splitting hairs, but here's the difference. I've I've I found a way to talk about it. Prosperity gospel is uh, if you're blessed, it's because you did something right. Well, that's what that. Means. Well, and then if you if you're having issues in life, it must be your fault too. The difference I see here is kind of like once. Um, the commandments are given in uh, Exodus, and it says, keep my commandments, and when you get to the promised land, it will go well for you. For me, that's more just a statement of fact of God's ways are good ways. If you follow God's ways, then that's better for you, mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of the consequence if then. Like I said, it's splitting hairs. I think it's more just saying God's ways are good. If you follow God's ways, you have a better chance. Yeah, then... <laughs> You're in, you're in tune with God. That's good for you. If you're out of tune with God, that's bad for you. I think that's just stating conditions as opposed to if you buy my book and if you give money to my church and if you mm -hmm. you know do X, Y, Z acts of charity, then you will get into heaven. And then, then your life will be blessed because that will fall apart. Because, you know, if you think of Cancer does not discriminate against what social class or mm -hmm. uh, where you come from. Uh, domestic violence can happen in any uh, wealth class, any ethnicity, any you know, like th things. Bad things happen across the board. Mm -hmm. You know, folks that seem more blessed might they have a better way of covering it up, or might be a little more insulated. But they're not. So the whole idea is that you walk with God, so that when bad things happen, you're not alone. You have people around you believing in not the bad things you're doing. That's an interesting point, though. Yeah. Balaam could have just got off the donkey and walked ahead, or Job could have denounced God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we could have had a different outcome here. Yeah. Is there anything to say about that? About choice, you talk about? I guess. Yeah. So, what are these trying to teach us? I guess is my question today. Um, the question today is that you will face opposition, whether that is capital S Satan or other kinds of adversaries. You're going to face opposition. It could be on a Job cataclysmic level, or it could be on a Balaam, my donkey steered me into a wall level, 
not so bad. It could be this sort of heavenly scene of somebody wanting to get their guilt removed. But we're going to face opposition. And God is going to try to intervene. In Job's case, not <laughs> God's intervention, Job could have said no thanks. Um, but God is not removed from it. I don't know. That's that's my takeaway so far. And I've, I, I basically, I have written down, read this passage, does this explain Satan? Like, does this, what does this tell us about God? I don't, that's part of why we do these conversations together, because now we, we work on it together. I, there's been, this is not the first book written on evil. So, yeah, I don't have all the answers, but what I'm getting out of this conversation is that you're going to face opposition and that God is involved in our lives. Yeah, if, if I think of uh, other stories, right, where there isn't Satan, sure. you know, it seems in these there was a good outcome. Um, Joe when, did get a new family and knew everything. Yep, yep, yep. Everything. Mm -hmm. knew everything. Um, where there tends to be a bad outcome, sort of as, as you tr especially as you transition mm -hmm. through the stories of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. they did it to themselves. Yep. Yeah. There, was, right. there, there wasn't an accuser there. So, yeah. is, is there, I don't know if there's something well, underlying in that, right? Yeah. You know, maybe when you have adversity, someone's in your court, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I've described the book of Judges before as a, a cycle because the same thing keeps happening. They, things are great. We don't need God. They mess up. Bad things happen. God help us. God is the judge. <laughs> but I said it's not just a, a circle. It's actually a downward spiral like a toilet flushing because it just gets worse every time around. And it's people doing it to themselves. Is Kings a little bit like that too? A little bit. Kings is a little bit more of a... I mean, David and Saul, Saul, David and Solomon, all three kings do good things and then really do a breakdown because of mm -hmm. their own action. Yeah. So, yeah, pretty much the whole testament. That, that's what it seemed like, right? You know, yeah. they and get to a good place and then they start to spiral and then something has to happen to bring them back to the good place and then they yeah. need judges. And... Yeah. <laughs> Around with Satan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> There's your title. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. A lot of years. Was plan A to change that inevitable cycle. Jesus comes in and keeps it from going like this and reaches it down, pulls us up, breaks that cycle. Have we broken that cycle? As a, as an individual, I think we can now. <laughs> But as a society, as a culture, as a whole, have we broken that cycle of... No. <laughs> so that's where Luther would say that we're simultaneously saints and sinners. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a lot of Bible folks would say we're in between the already and the not yet. Jesus came, gave a, the death blow to sin, death, and the devil, but they're still lingering until Jesus returns, and that's when the whole revelation thing comes in the video. I think Roger was right when he talked about age or, you know, experience. The older you get and you look back on your life and things that you thought were really bad, or you look back and not blame others, you screwed up yourself, but, you know. In my Legion uh, magazine, they had a joke the other day. And in the back of the Legion magazine, what it said was, it says, why is it seem the older you get, the less stupid you are, and the reason is because you've already done it once before and you don't right. want to do it again. There's probably more truth that was that. Yeah. Yeah, Let's do one more passage. I've got, we'll, we'll just cut this off. There's no, there's no like structure, like set goals, like to how this is going. So next week we'll, we'll get in on the serpent. And next week <laughs> yes, we'll get you. in on something that was used to justify the whole Lucifer fallen angel bit. <clears throat> so we'll get into some of those. Awesome. But let's just finish this last passage for here, uh, for these big four. So we're going to turn to Second Chronicles. So there's you know, the Samuels, the Kings, and then the Chronicles. Chronicles is basically a retelling, a different, slightly different version of Samuel and Kings. So Second Chronicles 21. Oh, we're not going to have time to do that one. <laughs> uh, not this group. <laughs> that's okay. That's right. Um, let me just see here. Uh, I am going to use 
use the book to help me figure out what verse to read on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, 21. Chapter 21, verse 1. Okay, so first, sorry, first chronicles. Can't read that. Oh, that's why. Okay, I'm like, yeah, first that's chronicles here. 21 1. There uh, Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to become the people of Israel. So this that's the only Satan reference. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing is basically David performs a census and God is mad about it. And there's different theories as to why. One is that the you know David tells the, the leader of the armies to go count everybody, and the leader of the armies is like, That's dumb, God's gonna be mad. What? <laughs> um, and so is it because the army guy left out two of the twelve tribes? Is it because by count, if there's a threat, David so far has won these battles because God was on his side. If you feel like you need to count your armies, does that mean you don't trust God is going to get you through anymore? Like you need to run the numbers? So that that's where the, the gist of this is. It's an odd story. It also occurs in 2 Samuel 24. Um, what you think you do without God's help is all him. Right. So there, this is the first instance where you get a little bit of that Satan pushing people to do something you shouldn't be doing, right? Because it says, um, um, somebody still have it open? I, I lost my spot. Mm -hmm. What is it, the first verse again? Satan rose up against Israel and caused David to take a census of the people of okay. Israel. So Satan doing something actively against God's people. That's a little different than what we've read so far. It and caused David, yeah. In the Orthodox version, that switch to doesn't have Hasatan there. It says Satan, the capital yeah, which is a little different. So. That's different. So maybe we'll talk about that one a little bit next time too. But yeah, we'll get into the serpent and we'll get into Lucifer. Um, but here, here's some just real quick thoughts that I had written down that come from these later passages. So one of the big questions is: does, Is evil all the result of human choices and consequences? Do we make <laughs> our own situation, or is there an evil force, the yang to the yin? Uh, Satan, the devil, pushing back uh, in opposition to God. But if we, I, have, I wonder, if we just say that the devil made me do it, basically, <laughs> is that a cop out? Mm -hmm. Yes. You yeah. know, was Hasatan the tester, the inhibitor, like uh, Balaam and Dabi, the accuser, and over time grew in the role to become the source of evil. Is that a way of removing ourselves from our own consequences and responsibility? And then I, the other part I wrote was, you know, the Bible is consistent, both testaments, when it's talking about hubris, pride, the mighty being brought low, Mary's song, the Magnificat, you know, oh, you know, blessed are you, God, for you bring the mighty down from their thrones, you send the, the rift away and lift up the hungry, right? But that's a constant theme through both testaments. Um, where, where do you get so, dual personality. Well, and so I said, uh, Luther, my favorite passage of Luther, you guys have heard this, is from Freedom of a Christian. He says, a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none when it comes to our salvation, right? It's all grace. And then he says, the Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant to all, subject to all. Because God has freed us, therefore, we act as little Christs in the world, as he says, okay? So we're freed from justifying ourselves, freed for being Christ in the world. So if each of us is all little Christs, are each of us just as inclined to be little Hasatans? Mm -hmm. <laughs> my own more safe you. Beat mm -hmm. me to all my last lines. <laughs> we are simultaneously saints and cynics. That's what we can say. So chew on that. Like, you know, like you brought it you know, in a major duplicity there. Well, and, and that's that duality thing, too. Is it that there's God and Satan fighting each other, or is that an individual going on? There's a both. So that's what we're going to keep unpacking. Are we just the small version of the big thing going on? I don't know. And if so, and then we're going to get to, if, if so, so what? What does that mean for us? What do we do with it? And that's where the conversation will keep going. Thank you, everybody, for watching at home. Um, I think that's in all of us, except for our free will, to make a difference of which one you're going to follow and which one you're not. Let's, let's close with prayer. Uh, gracious God, thank you for this day.
Uh, thank you for intervening in our life. We don't always understand the why and the how, but we know that you are with us. We don't always understand what's going on when we're in the middle of it. Sometimes we are lucky enough that the Holy Spirit can help us through hindsight see your hand in things. But other times we just don't have the answers. Sometimes we identify with Job. Open our eyes like you did for Balaam. Intervene when we're going down the wrong path. Help tip the scales of our own saint-centeredness towards your will. Give us access to your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. I'll get to him. Yep.